Good evening, Rotterdam. How are you? Just a few words before we begin. First of all, I thought it was important tonight to introduce someone to you. About a year and a half, or nearly two years ago, I met a young Dutch composer. Without whose help, we wouldn't be doing these concerts. And uh, I wish to publicly state that. And I wish you to give a warm welcome to Marco de Gui, please, ladies and gentlemen. The concerto has changed my life in a couple of occasions. You know, 1969, uh, it gave me the knowledge that I could write for orchestra, um, and I, I went on to write more for orchestra, and it gave me that confidence. In 1999, it it uh, gave me the realization that, that that there was something else I wanted to do with my life rather than just be a member. Of, I said, just be a member of Deep Purple. It's been all-consuming. So, in a way, it was Marco, the Dutch genius, you know, the, the, the reconstructing the concerto that also helped to change things for me. The way it all started was, was first of all in uh, in '94, when uh, Ian Gillen had said something along the lines of, "It'd be great to do the concerto again," you know. Uh, and after I picked myself up off the floor, you know, with surprise, uh, I, I said, "Are you sure?" Because Steve had just joined the band. I think there was a, a feeling of great optimism. Uh, in the band, because after Richie leaving in '93, there was a feeling of like, oh well, that's kind of it then, is it? You know. But then, moving forward with Steve and, and finding such a good buddy and, a, and such a great player to, to, to help the band continue, there was a feeling that we might want to do the concerto again, and wish it a happy 25th anniversary. Well, that's when we discovered that there was no score, uh, or that we couldn't find it. So the, the idea was sort of shelved. And then I started getting phone calls from this guy called Paul Mann, you know, uh, saying uh, that he'd love to do it. Uh, and that he, telling me of his involvement with it as a kid and then growing up, you know, and still thinking it's a great piece and all that kind of thing. He was also aware that the score had been lost because he'd tried to find it himself to study it. Um, and then it was getting close to, to its 30th anniversary and there was, I, I had given great thought to, uh, to trying to reconstruct it myself, but I, on all the occasions that I sat down and started to try, I realized what a gargantuan task that was. Uh, and then early 1999, I met um, the, 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 that young Dutchman, you know, who, who basically changed a lot for me, you know. And when he showed me those, those pages in that hotel in, in, in Rotterdam, of, 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 and I realized that it would work, I looked at it and thought, this is, this is the, the answer to our prayer, you know. So I went to Gillen and said, look, I think, I think we can do the concerto again. And uh, this was February, I think. So I said, with a bit of luck, we could perhaps do it on its birthday, you know. And I went to Bruce, and Bruce spoke to our agent and so on and so forth. And, and, and it's, it really started to, to gallop then, you know, towards uh, a conclusion.
was uh, the fulfillment of, I think, an entire lifetime of um, family involvement in Deep Purple. Because my uncle, uh, my mum's brother, Colin Hart, was Deep Purple's tour manager. He, he left home, uh, our hometown of South Shields, in, I think, 71, to become a roadie for Purple. And uh, one of the things he brought back to South Shields with him was uh, a copy of In Rock and Machine Head and also, of course, the, the concerto. So one of the first musical experiences I must have had was um, listening to the concerto on my grandma's radiogram. And uh, I do remember sitting there, um, you know, being swept away by this piece and um, on occasion... Uh, standing in front of the mirror with a white pencil and sort of conducting my way through through the piece and fantasizing about one day actually getting to conduct it. Um, and I had uh, met with John uh, on the odd occasion uh, to just talk about the possibility of trying to do the piece again. And of course now the story is well known that the music was lost and it was reconstructed by this amazing Dutch composer and then John and I spent some time working on it. So when it finally was looking as though we were going to be able to do it, it just seemed like the most natural thing in the world for, for me to be involved. But it certainly felt to me like a, you know, like a little, a little full circle, you know, that, that we'd reached. I look back on, on that night with, with uh, pride and, and, and emotion, you know, it, it was to hear the piece again, played by one of the world's great orchestras. Uh, and to have the audience sort of so into it, uh, including the people who were, you know, like yelling out, rock and roll, you know, I mean, that was, it, it, it was a, a big night, a big two nights, a big emotional occasion. One wonderful part about it was when we, the first rehearsal was at uh, about eight o'clock in the evening uh, on September the 24th. Uh, and it was at about eight o'clock the, in the evening on September the 24th, 1969 that we played it for the first time. So there was quite a lot of synchronicity going, flying around uh, that night. I think as the 90s drew to a close and my 60th birthday loomed, you know, uh, I began to think to myself that I, I ought to, to move on. Uh, it had crossed my mind once a, a couple of years before that, but I was very swiftly talked out of it uh, by Steve Morse, actually. Uh, he said, hey, man, I just joined the band, don't go, you know. And, and, I, and I realized at that point that I didn't, I didn't want to go. What I wanted to do was, was to make more new music with Deep Purple. And so we did, I mean, Perpendicular and Abandoned were, were uh, great joys to make. It, you know, it was a great time in the studio. Playing with that band live is an, an astonishing experience. It, it, it's a, such a good band. Ian Pace and, and, uh, and Roger Glover, are, they're like two halves of the same whole. They, they, they hold that band rhythmically together so beautifully. Uh, Steve is a very giving player to play with. Uh, and uh, I got a new lease of life uh, on that. Back to Clicheville, you know, all good things generally come to an end. And I, I really did feel that, that I was reaching a point where I ought to move on. And the concerto tour um, rekindled my, my uh, love of, of orchestral music. I'd already made Pictured Within, which was a very personal statement, but had given me a glimpse of, of what I could do on my own, a, a glimpse of something that I was really proud of and, and, and could do on my own. So uh, it was, I think, uh, the, the catalyst that, that, that made me jump. It was, it's the most difficult decision I've ever had to make in my life because the, the, the other members of the band are not just other members of the band, they're my best friends. You know, they're, they're close, 
personal buddies, you know, uh, with whom I have gone through fire, ice, and dynamite to, to uh, borrow a, a title, you know, and uh, and with with whom I've had the most wonderful uh, musical experiences. So it wasn't just a question of saying, "Okay, guys, I'm coming up 60. It's about time I left." You know, uh, it was a lot more emotional than that, a lot deeper, and a lot uh, more. Uh, coruscating to, 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 to have to do it. But yes, the concerto tour did help me make the decision. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Um, it was something I ate. It wasn't really. 
I'd like to just introduce you to about 81 or 85 or just a few people just before we start. Um, first and foremost, our, our wonderful conductor, Paul Mann, please say. Please. And right here, all the way from Romania, our wonderful orchestra, please, from Transylvania. No, no, I'm saying it's terrifying. terrifying. Are there what? It's terrifying because, uh, I mean, there's an echo in there that's still ro rolling around the building from when the Moody Blues played it in 1972. <laughs> and um, well, the crowd will bring their own. Uh, well, the crowd will bring their own something, but, but it's it's very exciting, isn't it? Yeah, to, to play the concerto like that in that kind of non-musical way. I'm glad you said that because I had something else. I actually meant to say that. I've been meaning to say it for a couple of days now. Yeah, good. It's totally useless because yeah. it's always like. A second or yeah, in complete fact. darkness. Uh, every time I need a cue, yeah. I go for a cue, mm -hmm. and because you need the light before the cue, you know. I mean, I know the piece. Right. I think I bloody do by now. But, it, but but you know, the, sometimes you just want to check where you are and make sure that I'm not supposed to be giving someone a cue or but whatever. He said he has a hard time hearing it. And yeah, well, he, it. I, I would rather that he didn't dramatize it. To, uh, That's what I told uh, him. Yeah. Well, just give a wash. wash. Yeah. Uh, when we when the band's up and playing, give, give it a wash. Give it a nice wash. Wash your hands of the whole thing. Excuse me, I'm just going to dry my hands. Well, I don't think there's too much excitement on the stage. But when it's that far off, John, when it's that far off... I know. It's normal. <laughs> I need night. I wasn't sure how it was going to work. I was nervous as a kitten. I had a dry mouth. I was pacing around backstage. As, and to stand backstage and hear the band that I formed playing songs that I'd helped to write with a different keyboard player was, was the most complex of emotions that were, were, were flying around. It was very strange to have it done that way and, and it really was, the funny thing is it was actually my fault that it, that it was done that way because the, what was going to be my swan song tour was in the February uh, and I was the one that caught the flu first and it went round the band like wildfire and in the end dear brave Ian Gillen who tried so hard to keep going through you know the, 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 this cough and cold that was just debilitating him had to finally admit defeat and we had to cancel and re-engage uh, re the, the, the tours for her. But the nearest we could get was September. So of course, my, the whole thing of me at the end of that tour saying to the world, okay, or to the world or to whoever would listen, you know, that's it, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. I've had a m magnificent time and thanks for all your support, but I'm out of here, you know, bye bye. Um, how, I would have said it, I hope, a lot better than that, but... So the, the, we were in Hiatusville, and, and so when it got to going back to do the, the gigs in September, Don was by then, you know, in the band and, and, and was doing... Uh, had done some 60 dates with them, you know. Uh, so on the one hand, it would have been... Uh, 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 sort of rather stupid, I think, to hoik Don out and put me back in just for those September dates. Uh, and on the other hand, there were a lot of people who had, still had tickets which were going to be good for the, uh, for the concerts, having bought them when I was in the band. So we had a, 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 a difficult situation there. And I think it was actually, I think it was Don who came up with the idea of saying, well, why, doesn't, why don't I do the first part? And then when it gets to the part where John normally used to introduce Perfect Strangers, he could actually do that. And he could do Perfect Strangers, and then you know that will be his farewell thing. Well, it just kind of grew from that, and we added to it. And uh, in the end, we ended up. I played some. Don played. Don came back and played a bit, and then we played both together, and that sort of thing. Looking back, it was uh, the, absolutely the right thing to do.
one of those things welled up in me, you know, that sometimes you just can't stop. And I just, uh, I was in tears. Uh, I had a lump in my throat uh, that I couldn't quite swallow down. It was an, a, a, a marvelous, marvelous moment. It was of my own choosing. I mean, I was leaving the band by my own volition. Uh, and yet, I didn't want to at that moment, you know. And each time when it got to the, another number I'd play, and I think, well, I'm never going to play that again. And then I heard Don playing like Woman from Tokyo, and I thought, oh, shit, I didn't get to play that, you know, I'm not going to play that again. Or whatever. That, but those kind of silly things that go through your mind. But then at the end of the evening, uh, when we all went to the front of the stage to, to say thank you, and I suddenly realised that, that the rest of them had stepped back uh, and, and left me on my own uh, to, to take a round of applause, bless them. And I uh, almost didn't make it off stage without just making an utter fool of myself. Well, Martin Buzzacott, yes, he, he, I think what happened was that John was in Brisbane with Purple and they had uh, a breakfast meeting. The rest of the band, I think, were, were literally kind of on the bus, you know, waiting to get out of town and move on to wherever they were going next. And John was having this discussion with Martin and Martin is a confirmed Purple freak and has always loved the band and, and particularly a, a fan of the concerto. And he runs the, uh, he's the artistic administrator of the Queensland Orchestra. And so it was his dream to bring Deep Purple down to do the concerto with the Queensland Orchestra. Well, that turned out not to be possible um, for a variety of reasons. And so the idea evolved into uh, doing the concerto for the first time with another band. And it was Martin who came up with the idea of using this uh, young uh, Brisbane-based band called George, who turned out to be sensational. And they, they came in, uh, I think, quite intimidated by the whole idea, um, but still with very, very strong ideas of their own, very positive ideas. They were not at all interested in emulating the way Purple did it uh, or, or, or uh, of, of trying to... Um, to do it in that way, they totally addressed it as their own piece, which I thought showed incredible strength of character and, and, and great musicianship. A tribute to the to the piece as well, you know, that the fact that the piece could could stand up to to uh, to any approach. Um, and uh, now, back here in Perth, doing um, doing it again with George a year on with a different orchestra. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to see again because of course they're a year on now. They've they're a, this last year for them has been incredible. The success they've had with their first album and they obviously played a lot more together even in that uh, in that time since last year. And so what's happened is that they they've also grown with it and um, uh, and of course they did also the performances in uh, Sydney at the festival, which unfortunately I wasn't available for. Um, but um, you know, so it's uh, it, it's the piece is is proving indestructible and proving really durable and uh, and open to any kind of approach. I've just had the first rehearsal with the Sydney Symphony, um, who sight read it uh, and gave me goosebumps. Right. You know, it yeah. was it was brilliant. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm I'm sitting there thinking. You know, it's just not a bad old piece. You know, it's it's, <laughs> like, you know, it, it's all right, and it was. Uh, 
It was lovely. To, yeah. to, and not just, I mean, orchestras uh, have the, the, the quality of, of, of the back desks, for example, is, is so much higher than it was, say, 40 years ago. So I, I, I don't, it's a sweeping statement, but it, certainly in the, in the orchestras that I've worked with lately. Mm. Uh, I worked with the LSO in, in, in 99 on this piece, and, and it was an astonishing experience. And, and today, my uh, wildest dreams were fulfilled. I mean, the SSO is a great orchestra. Sydney Opera House? Wow. I mean, you know, that was on my list of places that had to be played before I stopped. Uh, so to finally get the chance to play it was, was marvellous. And it is a wonderful building. I, I, and what a dressing room. I mean, my dressing room at the Sydney Opera House had a view of Sydney Harbour Bridge. I mean, you know, many dressing rooms are, you know, with that kind of a view. Uh, the shows were wonderful. Sydney Symphony Orchestra, what a fine orchestra that is. They, they really came to play. They, they, they had no uh, two ways of looking at the concerto. They came to play it. And George turned in a, a wonderful... I like the way George played my concerto. It, it's, it's very different to the way I conceived it, the whole thing. But it's, it, it has its own logic. And uh, it proves that the piece will stand uh, you know, being looked at in, in, in a different way. So, uh, so I was, I was very, really pleased to have had the experience of playing it with them. I think they really did, um, they didn't take anything for granted. And a lot of what they did w couldn't have been uh, more unexpected. You know, the, even just the very first entry, they play that first entry in a very strong and positive way. But then they, they play a half tempo and they play a much more laid back sort of initial entry. They kind of, kind of minimize the conflict in that first movement rather than what I think John originally had in mind and certainly the way Purple did, which is that they maximize the conflict. This is very much a case of, a, of an orchestra versus uh, a band um, uh, uh, trying very hard to kind of hold their own against something which is obviously much more powerful than, than they are. Australian band George are going to be performing mm. the concerto for group and orchestra with you as part of the festival. Why, why George? Did they, did they come to you? Yeah, um, they did it last year, last February, at uh, QPAC and, um, with the Queensland Orchestra. Mm. And what were your impressions of that? I, I loved it. I mean, they, they, it's a totally different take yeah. on it. Uh, and I'm thrilled to bits because I, the, the piece t uh, takes it. You know, which, which is very nice to find out. You yeah, know, that, that there's room for people yeah, to make their own that, that, that they actually su can support a different interpretation. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, very different. Uh, anybody who knows the, the piece as performed by Deep Purple will, will uh, have some lovely surprises. Yeah. So uh, they've, do you think they've, um, they've understood the, the story of the, of the piece a little differently? They've, they've taken a different kind of, a different, yes. different idea from it? Yes, yes, they've taken a, a, a more gentle, uh, attitude, mm. um, and it, it's it's interesting now because w in in the first movement where, where it's very much like a concerto grosso, you know, it's very much the the orchestra and the band, and the orchestra and the band, uh, the, and the, and the idea is that one keeps trying to supersede the other. You know, it's like it's it's, it's a kind of a bless you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of a na 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 thing, you know, like that going on between between the two. But now. It's George saying, you know, it's okay. You don't have to tear your hair out. It's all right. Just, just we'll, we'll be cool, you know. Yeah. And uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a different relationship. Yeah, I, I love it. It's yeah. a very, very pleasant way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, when we get to the last movement, then it, it's still plenty of sound and fury. But uh, yeah. yeah, but but the first two, the first movement is the is the most different. I yeah. I mean, it, this is again another tribute to to, to John's um, musicianship and also his flexibility because he's had to come in not only to, to another band, but um, into a very different approach than the one that, that he's been 
used to. Um, and what he's done, I think, is is added uh, color and a new dimension to what George had been doing. It's been wonderful to have him around to do these performances because it just means that we get one more chance to do the concerto. And as there, were, there was quite a long time span between uh, those three events, I thought it might be interesting to do something of my own, uh, you know, like pictured within style stuff down here. Playing songs from his classically inspired solo albums and Deep Purple's acclaimed Concerto for Group and Orchestra. Featuring a 10-piece classical ensemble and special guests including Miller Anderson. Deep Purple's John Lord, pictured within concert series. Call Ticketmaster 7 now for this Valentine's Day. But the best laid plan, plans of uh, mice and men, you know, often get buggered up as uh, to, to uh, misinterpret Robbie Burns. And I smashed my thumb about a little bit on, on stage at, at the Opera House. I think I was just so excited to be playing Sydney Opera House that I, uh, I forgot where I was momentarily and, and, and knocked my thumb on the, on the Hammond organ. Uh, which made playing the piano not a very good option. On the second night, I was I got rather overexcited at one point uh, in the fast movement at the end, and, and I smacked the my left thumb on, on the side of the hand and organ, and it's an old injury, uh, and it's exacerbated it and to the point where playing the piano is not really an option. Mm. Um, I can, however, still deal with a hand and organ. So the shows I was going to do in uh, Melbourne and at Sydney and up in Coolum um, were going to be based around Picture Within. Um, I've had to forswear doing that, I'm afraid, it, it's, which is a great sadness to me because I really wanted to, mm. you know, to do them live. I've done them live in, in Germany and, and France and, and uh, it, was, it, was, it worked really well. Yeah, so well, it should do, it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful yeah. place. Yeah, so, but rather than just go home with my sort of uh, tail between my legs and my, and my hand in plaster. Um, I've decided that we should have some fun. I decided to do some blues gigs instead. Uh, somebody suggested that a rather fine little blues man called the Hoochie Coochie Men would be a, a great place to be and uh, and it was. What, what fun that was. Great guys and and I haven't played blues uh, you know like straight improvised 12 bar uh, funky blues, you know, since since my first band, you know, way back in the 60s before Deep Purple. That's the kind of music we used to play, like English R&B, you know. Uh, and it was enormous fun. Bob Daisley, please come to the oh. front and set us there. Any bothering? Nothing. All right. Mr. John, Tim, Jim Alleyway. Rob? We go way back. We go way back. He was loitering by the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Sometimes when you <laughs> when you're playing, when it's not your own. You can get rid of it. Oh, up. Well, some, some days you get rid of it.
I really enjoyed playing in the Athenaeum. That was uh, in Melbourne. That was a, that's a nice theatre, and that, that had a different feel to it. To the basement, the basement was much more in your face. You know, the front row was like, I don't know, four inches away. It felt like, and, I, there were, and it was so close to the audience. There was a woman sitting behind the, the Leslie speakers, who, who was kind of almost co having a conversation with me. You know, about how I ought to be playing lazy. You know, and I'm sort of trying to tell her that you know. That's really not what it I, I, what it's about, but but uh, but all very kind of pleasant. There was no acrimony involved. You know, it was just me, me and her having a, having a conversation about. It. Uh, I enjoyed the basement. It was great fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was a piece by uh, a hero of mine, Jimmy Smith. It's called Back at the Chicken Shack, which leads me to suppose that I really ought to write something called Back at the Basement, and then, then you might have me back. Playing by a swimming pool in in, in Coolum, you know, I mean, uh, and being bitten to death by mosquitoes, that was fun too. Basically, I ended up playing at a barbecue, and um, and I haven't done that since I was, at, you know, about 16. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, very nice. Really nice thing to say. It's always good to play to people when they're full of food. <laughs> and wine. Yeah, of course. Of course, normally the band is more full of wine. <laughs> Usually the wine is, I have paid this room. <laughs> I went to the gig in Coolum and that was just wonderful fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Except for the mosquitoes, which bit me to death. I looked like I'd been shooting up in the dressing room. But, I was, no, I was, um, but it's, uh, that was great. And it's, it's, it's in bo at both ends of my rock and roll career in, in Australia. The, the first time that we played in Australia as Deep Purple, we played it at a swimming pool in Perth. Uh, an Olympic size swimming pool, uh, where the audience were, you know, on the other side of the pool. Um, and then here I am, what, 30 odd years later, playing where? At a swimming pool. Uh, this is actually a song <laughs> from a band that I used to play with. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's what, one that Jimmy also used to sing when you, when you were, you know, knee high to a... Yeah, my first band. You were first band. <laughs> so, uh, Deep Purple was one of my favourite bands, mate. So, <laughs> so, so, so that here. God bless your heart. Likewise, mate. I and mean, so the 20 bucks has to work, then. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 
just a blind man And my world is fake When a blind man cries I like the way Jimmy does Blind Man. It, it's, it's, a, it's a far more um, tortured version, uh, way of looking at it, than, than uh, Ian's is, uh, Gillen's is very, uh, quite stately and, and sad. Um, Jimmy's is, is, you know, much more racked, you know, like really going for the, the gut emotion in it. Uh, and the song seems to support both versions. He, he gives you a hundred percent every time, Jimmy. There's no, there's no half measures, you know. And I remember, you know, when he when he came around with us uh, on the last Australian tour with Purple, and uh, got on stage and did the encores. I mean, that was enormously good fun. Great to see Bob Daisley again after all these years. I mean, you know, uh, nice man, really, really nice gentleman, good, honest, solid, real bass player, you know. Beautiful playing. Tim Gay's great stuff. I mean, wonderfully committed blues man, you know. I, I, I thought it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. And, and the fact that we sort of got, went on Australian television on, you know, live on, on what, what was it, a Friday night, was it? Uh, and, and played, a, you know, like a really nice slow blues. It was like, I guess that's a first. Nothing left to lose now I lost everything I had And all I got's more bad news Every minute of every hour of every day 24-7 blue idea that John had had uh, in his mind, I think, for quite some time was that he wanted to write a piano concerto or at least a, a concertante work, including a big piano part. Um, and uh, that I think as a, partly as a result of doing the concerto with the Brisbane Orchestra last year, um, the idea was, um, was to give the piece its premiere um, in, in Brisbane. And uh, it turned out to be the best possible way to bring the piece to, to life because uh, that's a particularly it's a particularly fine orchestra, but it's also a particularly good-natured orchestra. Uh, and they had to work extremely hard to get the piece ready. It's very difficult. It's turned out to be very hard. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute minefield for the soloist. It's full of difficult things for the soloist to do. Uh, and Michael Kieran Harvey was an absolute star and t took me by surprise in one or two places on the show because he really just went for it. It was incredible. But the orchestra also, I had a very tall order. It's a tricky score. It's turned out to be quite difficult. And, um, and we had a whole day of very intense, very, very demanding rehearsals. And they just approached it with such, uh, such commitment and such energy. It was, it was just the best possible place to do it.
third movement, strings. <clears throat> Could we do the whole movement music? Yeah, Allegro Vivace, and sends a sword also, cellos just before the yeah. Allegro. OK. Allegro. <laughs> We got that one, John. This is, this is this is two before sixty-eight. Yeah. Ah. Oh, yeah, pa pause, a pause, yes. <laughs> when the clarinets start after keep here. Keep it really regular. Keep, if you yeah, can yeah, keep yeah, the left hand regular, yeah. that'll really help. Yeah. So, speak of 70, please. I, did we need to check notes there with the clarinets? Or? At, at, uh, at 70, where they come in? Let's hear it again, because yeah, yeah. it may just be with reading. Yeah. Pick of 70, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
bring it a little slower, I think. Okay. I, mean, I know you like playing. It's great having it. It was actually written to be played. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. It is. You know, it's actually, so it should be played. But, keep it, keep it but I'm just wondering if we, if we just yeah. hold it back there, then then we we don't get so much of a gear change. You're right, Sunshine. <laughs> Together now. <laughs> you know, that's the only yeah, kind of okay. thing that we want to avoid, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I don't know what I want to do. Are you happy with this stroke here? Very much. Is so. that just, it? Just doesn't. No, 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 no. At the first, the second you turn around and said you really want that. Yeah. And to your credit, that you said that when you first read the score. Do you mean jeté? And I said yes, I did. I think it doesn't work. It would just work if there wasn't quite so much sound going on. It, it, it's just going to sound like a kind of herd of chickens. <laughs> you, could, you could do a Motown slide. <laughs> yeah. they, they could do. I'll run into you. Bum, bum, bum. Every other. And, 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 and piano, if possible. Just like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Being played from the euphonium. The part. euphonium part. Yes. I'll, we'll ask them. We'll ask them. He might might be able to just do that. Do you mind if I use your piano, Michael? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, you're right. See, that would be nice. If it goes dun da da, bum ba bum, dun dun da dun da dun, dun da dun. You know, uh, if it's not kind of silly to mark a tambourine p p p, but not at all. No, you can just touch it. I think it's fantastic. The the, the guy playing the xylophone, isn't he splendid? Right. Fantastic. I think. Um, I don't know, I'm reluctant to... It's the old joke about asking the symphonists to change sticks that they hate it, but, um, but I wonder if that bit where the timpani joins in with the piano and the percussion here, sticks. if I could ask him to use wooden sticks or just harder sticks. Because it's so rhythmic in the, in the upper parts, because with all the brass and all the upper rhythm and the upper strings all on yeah. that, <laughs> that's, so a good, that's a good moment. It's yeah. a I like that. Really yeah. great. Moment. Uh, yeah, if, if, if <laughs> I mean, uh, you can give him an extra, uh, give him another F if you want. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> give him another F, lad. Give him another F. Aye, that's what they bloody yeah. need, another F. That'll, that'll sort it. Hard, this is a hard piece. And when we programmed this, when we put the program together for this, um, of course this piece wasn't written, so we had no idea how long it was going to be, we had no idea how difficult it was going to be, um, and it's just been fantastic work. Thank you so much for today, it's incredible hard work. Um, and so, but it's not over yet, let's play through the whole piece and then just see where we are, and if we need to top and tail anything, we'll have a little bit of time left over at the end to do that. So. Here we go. <clears throat>
The piece itself, um, I think, is a real watershed for John. I think it's it's a it's it, it's a, a piece that is both very personal uh, in that I think it is be because of the way that the poem affected him, the D. H. Lawrence poem upon which it's based, and because of all the resonance that 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 conjured up. Um, the piece is effectively a sort of musical autobiography, um, but it's a work that I don't think John would have been able to write had he still been in Deep Purple, um, because the amount of time that it takes, the sheer amount of of time that it takes to produce a work like that, is to just with all the things that they were doing, it would have been impossible. So I think for him, that's also a, a landmark. It's also a landmark in the sense that um, this is the first time he's written a real contribution to the repertoire in that sense. You know, the concerto was, was for Deep Purple and the Gemini Suite was for Deep Purple and Saraband and works like that were his own solo projects and, you know, pictured within as a solo album in, in that sense. So this is the first time he's written a piece that's not intended for him to play. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Deep Purple. It's not a solo project, and that's it. But it's just an orchestral work, and from that point of view, that's also um, that's also a landmark. So in every possible way, this is uh, you know this has been a really uh, important event, and and so for me, it's been a real privilege to to bring the piece into the world. I was, of course, in a state of some terror uh, as the piece was being played. Uh, in the concert, but that morning I'd had the huge privilege of sitting in the balcony of the of the, of the hall in Brisbane and, and seeing the entire concert played uh, at, at the general run through, and and I was the only guy there, so I, I got a, an orchestral concert all to myself, uh, with the other plus that one of the pieces being played was mine, so uh, so that gave me a huge buzz.
so clean, I want a clean fight. Yeah. Right? Did Paul tell you about playing the last movement in reverse? He, he did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I finished screaming, no. <laughs> yeah. no, I want a clean fight. When I yell break, break? Yeah. Yeah. straight so, break. I actually yeah. asked the auction to, to transpose it. Oh, that's <laughs> actually no, it's a it's a down. Yeah. Because it goes slower at some time. I'm playing the computer program again. Yeah, yeah. 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 Australia's. Yes. Did you hear about this? Yes, I did. <laughs> How are we doing? Right, I'm going to get out of your hair. I'm going to yeah. uh, gather up my family, yeah. like a yeah. mother hen. Right. And I'll see you at the other end. Okay. In Boca Lupo, my friend. Yes. Oh, and it's all for you. Okay. Yeah, is that possible? That's fine. That'll be, be much better. Oh. Okay. Crap your Lupo, mate. Thank you, mate. And you'll say to you. Now, you have a wonderful time. We will. We, and, uh, we might even get it right. So um, I know you will. I know you will. And I'm, I'm, trying, I'm going to sit there and explain to my daughters what the young person's guide is all about so that they can follow that. Yes. Well, I was, I'm decided not to say anything at all to the audience in the first half. Yeah, I know. Just because I think it, it's better if we just play it. And then the second half, I'll do a bit of, do a bit of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cover, because we've got lots of scene changes. Well. Fantastic. Good one. I'll read. See you later. See you later. See you later.
uh, th I thought the piece went really well uh, that evening. Um, I, I, I was listening with it, maybe different ears to say that you might listen with because I was listening to see how little bits worked and whether that had come across better or worse than it did in rehearsal and so on. And then at the end, Paul beckoned me up on stage to take a bow, you know, as the composer. And, and I got up there in a state of utter euphoria because it, it was such a great performance, a, a, a stonking great last movement. The pianist just w went for it. It was, and Paul was hanging on, you know, like grim death to, to stay with the guy and succeeding, I hasten to add. Um, and the orchestra played like heroes. So I got up there and, and it seemed like the people in the, in the audience had really enjoyed it. Oh, well, there was more than that. There was a standing ovation, uh, you know, and this not from a hall of Deep Purple fans standing and, 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 and applauding the keyboard player of Deep Purple, but from a hall of Queensland Orchestra subscribers and regular classical concert goers who had been moved and, uh, and thrilled. And the pianist, uh, again suggested by Martin Buzzacott, Michael Kieran Harvey, oh, an astounding pianist and a lovely, lovely man. And he took the piece right at face value. He, he, he understood what I meant. By the, by, in the writing of it, and, and he said yes immediately as soon as he was asked if he would do it, because uh, he'd been a Purple fan too, you know, so I think his first album was Machine Head, yeah. Um, but here he is now, this, this kind of astounding uh, concert pianist who's, whose speciality is, is, you know, really stark, modern, I mean, his speciality is like Bartok and, and Messiaen and, 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 and Ligeti and so on. These very difficult, difficult uh, modern writers. And, and he took my piece uh, to his heart. My piece is difficult. The last movement is a, is a bit of a tour de force for the pianist. It's not easy at all. Uh, and, uh, and he worked his magic on it. And it, it was fantastic. What a wonderful night. I'll always remember it. If I live to be... 150, you know, I'll, I'll remember that night.
I'm going to uh, go back in the studio as soon as possible uh, to uh, do another album of, of uh, solo pieces, uh, like Pictured Within Part Two, if you like. Um, that's due. I mean, I, it should have been done last year, but uh, and then you know I got, I got quite busy. Um, so I'd like to get into the studio as quickly as possible, as soon as I get home from Australia. Uh, I want, uh, there's some revision work to be done on Boom of the Tingling Strings. There's a few things I learned from, from hearing it played that I want to just put right, a bit of tweaking here and there. And there's a couple of new pieces that, I'm, uh, that I've been asked to write uh, that I've got to get down to. Um, so, so there's no shortage of work. I'm signed to EMI Classics, yeah, for, to do, to do uh, solo work. Um, I'm very excited about that because you know, I've been on EMI most of my working life and um, it's, it's nice to be there. I mean, I've, I've gotten absolutely 100% uh, joy from my, my uh, period as a member, a founding member of, of Deep Purple. I've got nothing, I'm, I'm not ashamed of one moment of it, apart from those trousers I wore on the video in 1969. But, um, y you know, uh, I've, I've had the most marvelous career with Deep Purple. Um, but if, if people are going to play my music, I'd, I'd just be happy to be uh, thought of as just, you know, that composer, John Law, you know, that would be a wonderful way to continue the next part of my career. But it, it, I, they can call me what they like, they can call me Bing Crosby for what I care, but, y y you know, as long as they, they listen to my music. Well, that day in Brisbane, it was there in a nutshell. We had from 10 in the morning till 4.30 in the evening rehearsing Boom of the Tingling Strings. And then we got in a car, and we drove two hours up the coast to Coolum, and there was John with the Hammond doing his magic stuff. And then the next morning, back in Brisbane for a 10 o'clock rehearsal, um, and the concert that night. And so within the space of 48 hours, there is a range of musicianship that I don't think there's anyone else in the world to, to, to rival. I want to go back on the road uh, as, uh, you know, as a solo performer and play the piano. Um, I've had a wonderful 30 odd years playing the Hammond organ. I really love it. It's a great instrument, you know, beautiful piece of furniture that makes music. I mean, what, what more can you ask for? Uh, but, but so does the piano. That's a, and I, I, my first love is the piano, and I would love to uh, go out and do some, uh, uh, some work with it, with a small ensemble of about maybe nine or 10 musicians, including a string quartet and some soloists and some percussion and me and and a couple of singers, and, and um, to do stuff from from my solo work and stuff that I'm going to be writing, and to play some things by other people that, that have attracted me and or have influenced me over the years, um, and just to talk to the audience, you know, and have a little natter and tell them this and that. Uh, I really enjoy doing that in, in like small concert halls, you know, not, uh, to get out of the arenas. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed being in the arenas with Deep Purple. They're, they're great, but some of them weren't built to, ma have, to make music in. They were built to play, you know, football in or something. Because you know, a lot of great Australians go up to the UK and, and enlighten us and enrich our lives. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's true. I'm from Paris. Paris. <laughs> 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 and then uh, you know, I mean, he's from here. I mean, well, his, his alter ego is from here. Bless, bless him. He's, a, he's actually a lovely man, and he's um, he was at a party with, uh, and he was nattering in the corner, and Mick Jagger came over and said, uh, "I really like uh, you know your Dame Edna character," and he said, "Thank you very much. It's very nice of you." And uh, Jagger said, "She's actually a lot better looking than you are." <laughs> Mistake, I think, you know, because Barry's got a, a swift tongue. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, oh, really? Well, I mean, you're not doing so bad in the wrinkle department, Mick. <laughs> and Mick said, they're not wrinkles, man. They're laugh lines. And Barry Humphrey said, nothing is that funny. <laughs>
be traveling Here be thunder And here be blue And sometimes heaven The thoughts of wonder The miracle of children A poet and a prayer Thank you.